evening. Welcome to our evening service. We are gathered around Hebrews chapter 13 this evening, and this will be our last study in chapter 13 here, which of course is the last chapter of the book. Uh, we, may, we may come back one more time to Hebrews and revisit just kind of as a recap of everything that we've looked at over, well, it's almost been three years now as we've been working through Hebrews um, on Sunday evenings. And so since we don't meet every Sunday evening, uh, it's taken almost three years uh, to make it through. But we are in verses 18 through 25 this evening. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Hebrews 13. And we'll be looking at these last few verses in the book of Hebrews. But let's pause for prayer before we start. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us, Lord, to grasp the truths that you have in this special book, Hebrews. We thank you um, for... Lord, the encouragement that we have received along the way, Lord, the rebuke uh, that we've received along the way, we thank you for showing us Jesus through this wonderful book. And I pray, Lord, that as we um, dig in again this evening and conclude, uh, Lord, that you would once again meet with us, speak to us, give us understanding, that you might be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have seen in verses 1 through 17 of chapter 13, we've seen a number of various commands. And uh, in this last chapter, the author has, has, got, has gotten very um, practical in the sense of he is speaking to daily uh, issues uh, within the believer's lives. And we come now to verse 18. And verse 18 through 25 really is the, the wrap-up, the, the prologue, the benediction. Um, it is the, just the, the, uh, the, the section that wraps up. Uh, the entire book here, concluding thoughts, and we'll read through that. We'll read through this uh, passage, and then we'll work our way verse by verse through it. Hebrews thirteen eighteen. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willingly to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Beautiful ending to this wonderful letter. And we'll begin here with the first two verses. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. The writer here begs prayer from the readers. He, uh, he begs prayer from them in a desire to see them soon. The prayer specifically, you'll notice in 19, verse 19, is to pray that he would be restored to them. And the idea there, of course, is that he would be um, brought back into physical fellowship with them once again, to be brought back into their midst. There is some 
hindrance to his travel to visit them. And he's asking God to remove it. He's asking them to pray for God to remove it. It's apparent here that he has made spiritual investment in them in their local setting. And now he's desiring to be brought to the possibility again soon of being with them physically. And we see here um, in verse 18, he says, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. We see here in this prayer uh, uh, th that he makes a claim as to the motive of his heart as that of his fellow laborers and that of his fellow laborers. He says, we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. He's encouraging them, he's beseeching them to pray that they might have their bond renewed uh, uh, physically um, in the same location. But he gives now the motive, and that is the motive of a clear conscience. He's confident of a clean conscience, and he uses that as the basis for wanting to return to them and asking them to pray for that return. We trust, or we have confidence, he says, that we have a good conscience. In other words, that we have pure motives. A clean conscience, of course, flows from a heart that is pure before God and in fellowship with God. It's not possible to have a good conscience or a clean or pure conscience without a pure heart and without real fellowship with God. Sin is what gives us an unclean or a dirty conscience. And the, the writer here is um, validating to them the motives of him and his fellow laborers. He speaks of we. We trust. We have a good conscience. In all things, he says, to live honestly. Out of a good conscience comes a desire to live well. And that really is the meaning behind the word translated honestly here. Uh, it is to live well or to live in a good way or a good fashion. It's a good manner of living, this, this living honestly that he speaks of. And it's all because of a pure conscience. And the pure conscience also is the reason, or the desire to live honestly, is the reason then also for a good conscience. His desire to live well encompassed each area of his life. Notice how he says it. We trust we have a good conscience. The idea of trust there is to have a confidence. It's not, it's not a hope. It's not wishing. It's not wishful thinking. We have confidence that we have a good conscience in all things. This is his testimony. We are willing to live honestly. Notice those three words, in all things. Every area of his life, of their lives, they were desirous to live in a good way. And of course, the only good way is in God's way. And so his desire to live well encompassed each area of his life. Notice now the benediction, we could call it, beginning in verse 20. He had asked for prayer in verses 18 and 19. Now, he gives a prayer, in essence. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect 
in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, that's a, that, that's a full load there. That's a mouthful, those two verses. But we're going to break it down piece by piece so that we can really um, grasp all of what he's saying in these two verses and uh, understand it better. The writer now begins what is in essence a prayer for the reader. Now the God of peace, he, he, he is lifting a petition to God for the people. At the end of all the doctrine that he has imparted to them in this letter, he sees the work of God as the only means of real transformation in their lives. He is praying, just to boil it down real simply, he is praying for God to do a work in them. Notice how he says it. Now the God of peace that brought you again from the dead of, uh, of our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect. Okay, there's the main thought. There's the main verb of these two verses, of this sentence, you could say. God, make them perfect. That's his prayer. That's what he's telling them that he's praying for them. May God make you perfect. So his prayer is for the perfecting work of God in them. Now understand the word perfect as it's used here and as it's used in many other places throughout the New Testament has the idea of to be made, uh, of to be made full, complete, or fully equipped. And that's the idea here. He is praying for God to fully equip them, to make them complete. Before we get into these details, let's consider first the descriptions that he uses for God and for the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he beseeches the God of peace. Now, the Hebrew concept of peace was the idea of being whole or complete. And so this really ties in with the idea of being made perfect in verse 21. May the God of completeness, the God of peace, may the God who knows how to make everything whole make you fully equipped in every good work. And so we see this description of the God of peace. But you also see a description of God as the God of resurrection power. Notice again, verse 20, now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. And so he speaks first of all of the peace of God, but he speaks secondly of the resurrection power of God, the God who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Now, why would he mention that? Why would he describe God in that way? Well, in what the writer is asking God to do, he sees God's power as the crucial element. Is it not? Here he was, penning a letter from a distance, unable to come to these people and sit with them or stand before them and preach the word, he knew that if their lives were going to be strengthened spiritually, if they were going to be transformed, that God's power would have to be in play in their lives. In other words, that God was going to have to, by his power, apply the words that he was writing to them. And so he sees the power of God as a crucial element. And the scope of God's power is best illustrated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
God's power was made most manifest in the resurrection of Jesus. And so we see him here described as the God of peace, the God of resurrection power. And then he goes on to speak of Jesus, the Son of God who is brought again from the dead. And he describes him as that great shepherd of the sheep. Knowing that Jesus is God's means of manifesting himself, we see the caring nature of God in this description of Jesus. If Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, and if Jesus is the manifestation of God to mankind, then we see through Jesus the caring, compassionate, loving nature of God. And that care and that love and that shepherding of these sheep to, who he, to, to whom he was writing was absolutely essential for their spiritual well-being. So we see these descriptions of God and of Christ. I want you to notice, secondly, the purpose of of God's perfecting work. The purpose of God's perfecting work. We see first of all, in verse 21, that the writer was uh, begging God to make them perfect, to fully equip them in every good work. In every good work. To do his will. You see, the outworking of God's truth is the performance of good works in God's perfect will. In other words, when God's truth takes root and grows in a believer's life, the result, the fruit of that, will be good works in God's will. Or for God's will. That is the outworking of God's truth. The performance of good works in his perfect will. God equips his children. He completes and perfects them so that they can accomplish his perfect will. And so we see the purpose of God's perfecting work. Number one, it's for every good work to do his will. But number two, it is working that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The perfecting work of God in the life of the believer is that we might work that which is well-pleasing in God's sight. Notice the next part of verse 21. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. God's purpose is to bring pleasure to himself. God's purpose is to make of you and me that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Every good work in us is the working of God in us to accomplish that which is well-pleasing to him. If you do a good deed and you do it in the name of Jesus, it's not you doing it. It's God, notice how he says it, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And that was his prayer for these people that the purpose of God's perfecting work would be accomplished in them. That they would be fruitful to every good work to do his will. That, they would, that, that God would be working in them that which was pleasing in his sight. And so we see the purpose of God's perfecting work. But notice with me the means of God's perfecting work. How does it take place? Well, it can't take place without what we see in verse 20 at the end of the verse 
the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. So the means of God's equipping work in the believer is the blood of the everlasting covenant. This blood, of course, is the blood of Jesus. As we've seen throughout our study of Hebrews, the blood of Christ is the means by which the new covenant has been accomplished. This blood once and for all makes the covenant it effects an everlasting covenant. Do you see that? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Christ suffered once for all. His blood was sufficient for all time and for eternity. We saw the contrast between the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice and the blood of bulls and of goats and those sacrifices. They had to continually come to offer those sacrifices. But this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, shed his blood for an everlasting covenant. So, that is the number one means of God's perfecting work in the believer. Without that everlasting covenant in effect in your life and in mine, God cannot do his spiritual work in us. We have to have that blood of the covenant applied to our lives. To have that relationship with God through Jesus. But you'll notice also... That God's work to make us perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, it is through Jesus Christ. Here we see the second means of God's perfecting work. It's through Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of the new covenant and is thereby the person by which God works his work of completion in the believer. It's Christ in me. It's Christ in you. And the writer of Hebrews here has spent 12 chapters setting up Jesus as the one and only way, as the one and only answer to everything that they need. There's no need to look back, to go back, Jesus is everything for them. And he spent 12 chapters stressing that to them, driving that and drilling that into their hearts and minds. We see it emphasized here again in the work that God wanted to do in them as he makes you perfect through Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that probably is one of the most clear, uh, one of the most clear scriptures that deals with um, the principle of Christ in me, Christ in you, in the believer. And I'll read that verse here briefly. Where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Christ in me. It's Christ through me. And God's work to make us perfect is through 
Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in that last phrase of verse 21. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the work of perfection in the life of the believer is to the glory of Christ alone. It is God's glory alone. And that work in us to make us perfect, to make us complete in every good work, it's to do his will. It's to work in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, that he might receive glory forever and ever. Amen? Verse 22, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you, in few words. He now couples his prayer for the work of God in their lives with an encouragement to suffer this word of exhortation. This letter that he had written unto them as he describes it in few words He couples his prayer with, for the work of God with an encouragement for them to suffer the word of exhortation. What does he mean, suffer the word of exhortation? Well, that word suffer has the idea of bearing up or holding up. Now, what is the word of encouragement to which he's referring? Well, it's this letter. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Now, you and I can uh, debate whether this is few words or not, but no doubt he had much more to say than he wrote in this letter. But the word of, the, the word of exhort, uh, exhortation is the letter that he has written to them that he is now closing, and he is encouraging them to bear up the word of exhortation or to hold it up. In other words, don't let it slip. Uh, we could say, don't let it slide. Don't let it go off to the wayside. Hold it up. Bear up under this word of exhortation, these truths that I've imparted to you Suffer them. Hold them up. Don't let them slip. While the work in them is the Lord's, we saw that very clearly in verses 20 and 21. We saw God's work in them. And while the work in them was God's alone, they were to bear up under that work with a willing heart and a yielded spirit. They were to take these truths and they were to hold them high. They were to hold them up and not let them go. And as they did so, God, the God of peace, the one who brought again the dead, uh, again from the dead, the Lord Jesus, that God would be able to make them perfect. And so they have their responsibility, verse 22, to uphold the word of exhortation, to take heed to the truths in this letter. That only comes by faith. They were to put their confidence and their faith in what the writer had written to them. They were to have, of course, a willing heart and a yielded spirit. He concludes in verses 23 and 24, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Apparently he, the writer, of course, many believe the writer to be Paul, but he doesn't identify himself, but apparently the writer of Hebrews was a fellow laborer with Timothy. And he speaks here of Timothy's recent release 
from prison. He says, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. He lets them know that Timothy is no longer, that Timothy is no longer uh, in prison, held captive, but now he is free from prison. And he desires to travel with Timothy to see them. He says, Who, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. And so he sends his greetings to the leadership of these believers. And those believers outside of the reach of this letter, them that have the rule over you and all the saints. And then he extends the greetings of those in Italy, fellow believers, of course, with whom they were probably acquainted. Verse 25, he ends with these simple words, grace be with you all, amen. Here he ends with a prayer for the believer's greatest resource, the grace of God. Grace be with you all. Amen. It's a prayer. It is his heart's desire for them. He had given them a letter chock full of truth that they needed to embrace, to believe, to receive, to apply, to practice, to live out in very difficult circumstances. And he knew that they needed God's grace to do so. God's grace is unlimited in its power and reach. And he knew that God's grace would enable these believers to have Christ and his new covenant fulfilled in them. So he prays for the grace of God to be with them all. What a wonderful way to end this letter, to speak of the work of God in them, to speak of their responsibility to uphold the word of exhortation that had been given to them, and to pray God's grace upon them to faithfully execute their duties, to yield their hearts and their lives to the Lord. In total commitment in very difficult circumstances. I trust that our study through the book of Hebrews has been a blessing to you and a help. Uh, I trust that it, has, um, that it has strengthened your faith, your understanding of who Jesus is, and your understanding of him as the only way the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that God will continue to encourage us uh, from this book. As I said, next time we'll uh, most likely take a, an overview of the book, just kind of look back on what the, the main themes of what we've studied, studied in the book of Hebrews and wrap it up that way. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Dear Lord, we come to you now and just praise your name. Lord, for all that you have given to us in this book, I pray, Father, that you would help us to see Jesus as he is, the central theme, the central person of all that we need. I pray that we would make him supreme in our hearts and lives, that we wouldn't waver, but Lord, that we would move forward in strength, the strength of God, the strength of our faith in God. May you be glorified and honored, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.